Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. Together with my guests on this podcast, I go on a journey to discover how our current financial system works, why it's flawed and why Bitcoin is the most relevant technology that you, my fellow millennials, should understand and adopt. In this episode, I'm joined by Eric Kaysen. I had a little snafu with the audio of this episode, at least in the beginning, and I fixed that later. So when you uh, start listening now, my sound is a bit bad, but that will change within a minute or two, three. So yeah, Eric Kaysen. He's a prominent figure in the world of Bitcoin and a leading voice in the cyberpunk movement, known for his thought-provoking essays on the philosophical aspects of Bitcoin and digital sovereignty. His book, Crypto Sovereignty, captures his transformation from socialism to anarchism and underscores his advocacy for an independent money system, emphasizing the transformative potential of cryptography in the realm of Bitcoin. I absolutely love Eric's content and better yet his rants. So let's see if uh, he has some rants for uh, for this episode. I'm super excited to talk with him today. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thanks for having me, Ram. I'm uh, excited to be here. We, we already had a great conversation before we were recording. So we'll, we'll just keep it rolling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll keep it rolling. I love that you uh, mentioned, you know, the, the name of the, this podcast is Bitcoin for Millennials. Why? Why do you think this new technology is so important for millennials? Well, just going straight into it, uh, the fundamental truth is, is that like fiat money in the current financial system, it, it's designed explicitly on the idea of enslaving the younger population in order to be subservient to the older population. And I think that the primary example that you can see with this is in the United States. If you look at how the social security system operates and pays out right now, every single millennial who is working and paying taxes and paying into that social security system, they will never see any of that money. And I really want to start with the basis of the ethical idea of how a moral, nihilistic, disturbing, and frankly, exploitative a system like that is. And that's, that's fundamentally how fiat money is designed. That's the same reason why millennials struggle to be able to buy groceries because of inflation. They struggle to be able to buy an affordable home because of the way that those prices have been jacked up. And that this is about an entire system that is designed to enslave people to a form of life that is about working a 60-hour work week, being able to barely get by. And at the end of it, you will have literally nothing to show after 40 years of hard work. And so this is why Bitcoin is so radically important is that it was not designed for the rent seeking class that currently owns everything. This was designed to be a fair monetary system for all people everywhere across time. And that's the most important one is that across time, Bitcoin honors the fact that you can't just willy nilly make up new units of Bitcoin. And so by being able to actually have a static fixed supply of money that allows for money to do what it naturally is supposed to do, which is be deflationary. It's only in the last hundred years that we developed this uh, freak form of money that we call fiat, that the word fiat in Latin, it specifically means by decree. And that's what it is. It's fundamentally a lie that is designed to have value because there's a government behind it saying, if you don't accept this money at the value that we say, we can punish you. And all that that is, is literally an authoritarian decree. Uh, so what I saw with Bitcoin for myself was that this was literally a new form of money that was designed to escape from the enslavement of fiat. And I think it's really important, particularly at where we're at with both inflation and with the coming central bank digital currencies that are going to be deployed, that people really understand that Bitcoin was designed in order to free millennials from this system of time exploitation. I, I fully agree with what you said. The only thing I find difficult is also when I look at my own journey and, and like my conversations with other millennials is although what you say is true, a lot of millennials, especially in the West, aren't really, well, some people have problems, obviously, but we weren't, uh, we didn't grow up with problems, right? Like everything always worked and the money just worked and we never really, really doubted that, right? Do you think it's only when people encounter problems that they can actually, you know, perhaps find a threat that leads them to Bitcoin. Like for me, my, my situation, I don't know. I just ended up there just because I actually was confronted with someone who explained to me why money in the bank is not yours. 
uh, and that's kind of my uh, my biggest threat to to go more into Bitcoin. But like, how how do you view that? Like, how can people I mean, get into Bitcoin? For me, one of the big things that that really affected me uh, was really coming to understand. Uh, sort of how the global monetary system works. And, and I spent a fair amount of my youth traveling around the world. I spent time in Southeast Asia and other places. And I saw how endemic and horrific the amount of poverty going on in those places were. And it really fascinated me because I was like, how is it possible that these people can work so hard, be uh, so entrepreneurial, and yet they seem to barely be getting by? And that's when I started, you know, researching how the money system worked or like what the World Bank was was how these relationships work uh, and i actually got my degree in international relations sort of focusing both uh, on history and international economics so this really sort of opened up the whole territory for me which had me really understand how these systems function uh and what's interesting is that at this point in time i was still sort of this raw, raw socialist of being like we just like we just gotta elect the right people in the government and we just gotta get the right people into the right roles in order to change all of this uh, but as I sort of appealed back the layers more and more, I started to realize that like the, the incentives are actually so grossly misaligned in a way that like it doesn't it doesn't matter who's in charge of these systems. Like they're fundamentally designed to exploit people in a way that that it's very sneaky in the way that uh, we're sort of taught that like if something feels really good, then like it must be true. And that was sort of the line of thinking that led through for me to be like, oh, like we just got to elect the right people because like that feels good. They're saying the right stuff. That's how it works. But then when I really looked at the results of what was going on, you know, like um, like people venerate Obama as being this really wonderful liberal president who implemented all these great policies. But when I really looked harder at it, I was like, well, if that's true, like why is this Democrat liberal president the one that's actually responsible for drone bombing more innocent people than any president before? And I started to realize, like, oh, like, these whole ideas of Republican and Democrat, they're not actually that different at all. They actually seem to be very much committed to the same form. And again, with peeling back the layers more, I was like, well, what's this whole situation with war? And like, why does America seem to be involved in these continuous wars, whether it's a Democrat or Republican? And that's when I started to really realize, oh, that's about how the incentives are for the government to print money, for that to provide that to war profiteers, and for them to then encourage wars on both sides of the aisle. And it was, frankly, it was really dark and intimidating and scary to come to terms with. Um, and I also found a lot of people at that point, they're like, well, uh-uh, like turn on the Netflix. I, I don't want to look at this. And while yeah. I respect why people need to do that, uh, I find it frankly irresponsible. Like if we want the world to change in a meaningful way, we have to ask ourselves to actually think about how our many systems function and whether or not they actually are changing and providing for people in a good and meaningful way. And I think, frankly, if we look at the difference between growing up and today, I think we'll see that things are actually breaking down more than we would like to admit. Mm. And so what were your initial views on, on politics and economics when you grew up? I, I saw, well, you went from a socialist <laughs> to an anarchist. So were you always drawn to the socialist idea or like how, how did that grow? Yeah, so I mean, like, you know, I'm in sunny California right now. Uh, we're like a nice liberal oasis in the world where everybody sort of has the same forms of thinking. Uh, and, and like, to be frank, like, it's all very nice. Like, everybody cares about everybody else. We want to be inclusive. We want to help each other. It's all based upon these ideas of feeling, you know, and, and the idea of that, like, hey, like, rich people should share their money with poor people because those poor people deserve to have fair standards of living as well. Like that feels really good. That, that sounds correct. But the problem is, is when you actually start analyzing how that works economically, there, there are two fundamental problems. One is, is that on an economic level, well, you know, these rich people got rich, not just because, well, there are two different kinds of wealth. There's one that's created through general entrepreneurship and actually providing goods and services in a way that helps the world. And then there's another way that's much more parasitic and exploitative, 
And the irony is, is that socialists look at that parasitic exploitative relationship and they go, those are the bad people that take advantage of others and we need to get their wealth from them. But what they fail to realize is that those people get their money specifically through these regulatory frameworks and through being as close as they can to the money spigot. And they don't actually create anything new or valuable. And then there's this other class of entrepreneur who, who actually are really improving the lives of many people in very powerful ways. But this obfuciation between the two has, has you equivocate them in a way that specifically this other group, they get protection from government so that they don't have to pay those taxes and stuff. Meanwhile, your small entrepreneur, he gets squeezed out of existence because he can't actually make a business because there are ludicrous ideas that the government has them want to follow in order to be able to have that business function. So I think for me, uh, moving through some of this stuff and doing all of the research to really understand how economics works was really helpful. But then for me, it was really during the Occupy Wall Street movement that uh, I realized that money was obviously a key problem, but nobody had a solution to it. And for me, that's when I really got Bitcoin. And I was like, oh, like this Bitcoin thing is really important. Uh, and the other one for me is that like the idea of anarchism, I didn't understand how it could organizationally function in any sort of a meaningful way without the state. So that's why I went to socialism. But once I encountered Bitcoin, it allowed for this new idea of sort of digital anarchism to implement itself in me. And I started really kind of digging into that. And for me, that's when I pivoted away and I realized that, uh, in my opinion, the way that the state functions, frankly, is just as a violent apparatus in all forms. And that's why we need to do away with it, because now it's in a very extreme place where like it, it has the surveillance ca capacities to institute that violence against everybody in very discreet ways. And so I, I see a very real danger with the state today paired with the forms of technology that it uses. And so it's bit, it was interesting when I was like prepping for, for our talk, uh, Occupy Wall Street caught my eye, you know, and I was like, oh yeah, we had that, but there wasn't really any effect, right? Like it's nope. just, it just went away or something. It was like a media thing or like, oh, these people are still camping and then it went away. I, so I, I actually think it had one very powerful effect. And that was allow for people to get out and emotionally exude and express themselves, fatigue and exhaust themselves so that then it could fade away and collapse and we could repeat the same nightmare that we did through 2008. Because it was a very powerful movement that yeah. understood that the, the problem that was going on was with Wall Street and the way that Wall Street essentially controls everything vis-a-vis -vis money. But within that, there was no solution. There was no answer. There was no methodology to actually address the issue. It was just a lot of lamenting about the very real deep pain that people were experiencing because we lived inside of a broken money system. And the frank truth is, is that there yeah. was no solution really at that point in time. And even though Bitcoin had still started, it was still a very nascent experiment. And, uh, one of the things I think is really important to understand about Bitcoin is I'm of the opinion that from 2009 up until about, I'd say anywhere between 2013 to 2015, it was still very much an experimental phase. And it was figuring out if this was a possibility that it could work. And then after that point, when we saw the ICO boom and other things, there was this whole idea of maybe we could have millions of currencies, we could experiment with them, we could do all these other things. Turned out that was a giant shit show and a grift. And then it was finally sort of in the post-2017 boom that people were like, oh, Bitcoin is a unique form of money that is explicitly designed for everybody because nobody controls it. And that's when Bitcoin, in my opinion, sort of achieved its political mission that's now sort of accelerating and reverberating more and more, particularly as we're going into this world where governments around the world want to make a global central bank digital currencies that are interoperable with each other because like to be clear like that is the most powerful surveillance apparatus that has ever been developed and that governments around the world want to work in alliance with each other in order to make sure that all people everywhere have all financial and economic transactions surveilled at all points in time for any means that they see necessary 
Like that should terrify anyone who has any remote idea of what that actually means. Do you think that there are enough people who woken up to this? And if not, what would be the best way to reach the people that do know that there's a problem? I mean, like Occupy Wall Street was big. It was also, a, in a sense, worldwide, like across social media, right? Like people um, empathized with the actual people on the ground, et cetera, right? And, but I do kind of feel that like those people that were there were not like the cypherpunk type people or the digital natives slash millennials, like young people now adopting Bitcoin as well. It was feels more like the progressives, quote unquote, who I, I currently now think like, if you identify as a progressive person, you should be all onto Bitcoin. But that's another, that's another conversation, I think. Like for me, it feels like it's kind of like those types of people where the action or or the attention seems to shift from, you know, subject to subject. While at the same time, as you mentioned, like there there's real effort on the way to create a surveillance mechanism slash state slash technology that will also not bode well for these people. Like, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, so so I heard two questions there. Uh, the first one in regards to are there enough people that get it? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, and it's it's really exciting to see how many people get it. However, the big problem is is that we're not organized in a thoughtful way right now. Um, so, like to me, the next powerful iteration that we will see come through Bitcoin is like the its actual politicization in a in a totalizing way. And when I say politicization, like I'm not talking about contemporary politics with political parties or electing or voting on things like I'm talking about this very radical capital T, capital T, the political, like the apparatus throughout all of human history that has caused for radical shifts and changes in the same way that like the American Revolution was the political movement of the late 16th century that fundamentally transformed all forms of politics moving forward from then. So to me, like that's what Bitcoin represents in so far that like the internet also is part of this capital T, capital P, the political thing that now all people everywhere utilize the internet. It facilitates our commerce. It is our primary way of communicating and getting information. And yet somehow that same apparatus has nothing to do with contemporary politics in any meaningful way. Like that must change. And I think that changes by Bitcoiners essentially radicalizing their own movement and creating a vanguard that has the specific task of educating people around the world about what fiat money is, how it's designed to exploit and steal from them and surveil them, and how and why Bitcoin resolves that problem. Uh, and to the second part of your question, uh, I think, you know, both progressives and socialists, like they're, I very much believe like their hearts are in the right place. Like they have the correct desires to create a more fair and equitable world. However, they've been terribly misled in the ways and methods to do that. And one of the things that drives me absolutely bonkers is how often I meet progressives and or people that are deeply passionate about the environmental movement, they go, yeah, but, but Bitcoin wastes all of this energy. And I go, oh, is that so? So like, you're an expert in energy policy. So like, please tell me, like, why do you think energy markets frequently go into negative that? valuations? <laughs> you know, and they go, what? I go, well, you know, like if you have a wind farm and you're at full capacity, you have too much energy on hand. So you either have to sh pay people to shut down your energy capacity and windmill, which is an expense, or you can pay people to take that energy off of your hands. And they go, what? I go, so it turns out that like Bitcoin miners are actually very efficient at being able to do that because they can just switch on and off randomly however much they want to. So they can take up as much load as they need to. So it actually turns out that the most powerful and positive thing in order to get closer to a sustainable energy future that you desire is with Bitcoin. And it's pretty funny because a lot of times uh, they almost glitch out on that. And they're like, well, like I got to step away from this. 
And to me, like, this is one of the very interesting things. <laughs> and one of the things that I find the most concerning is that there's very little understanding of how much people are being played by propaganda and how powerful that is. And I frequently find, uh, particularly with boomer friends of mine, how much of a struggle it is for me to really try to present to them like, hey, like the, the, you know, and like this is sort of my own extreme anarchist approach of that, like, hey, like the government hates you and like they, they have no desire for you to have self-sovereignty or agency over your own life because of the way that like they're fundamentally and inherently alienated from you. They have no way to like know you in a personal or meaningful way. But because of the way that you have spent an entire life being told that the government loves you and cares about you and that, you know, they've made mistakes in the past, but they've remedied that, like, that's all bullshit. And it's really amazing because I think the Internet's really yeah. breaking that down. And that's why millennials are so much more powerful in this in this space of being able to get it, is that we can actually go out and find rogue information that the state does not want us to have and we can educate ourselves on, you know? And so it's really interesting to like talk to boomers about yeah. like, Hey, like MK ultra was like a real thing that happened. So same thing with the two CG syphilis experiments, same thing, you know, with all of the different procedures that violated people's constitutional rights and were just grossly unethical things to do. Like those all were real and happened. And so like, you really need to understand the history of the last 80 years in the West and the significant and severe wholesale abuses that governments have done to their citizens to really be able to actually step back and go, okay, maybe this actually is a system that's designed to exploit and take advantage of people in a way that I, I didn't appreciate or understand at this point. And to me, like that's sort of the key that pro progressives really need to understand is getting that like, there hasn't actually been an incident in human history where like the government was actually like leading the charge on helping people in a good and powerful way. And again, you'll get bullshit where people go, well, what about, you know, they, they ended slavery and, and, you know, black people got equal rights in the sixties. And I was like, you realize there was like massive fucking struggles from the people directly in order to like get those changes made. Like the government was just like, yeah, like, Yep, we're gonna like end slavery and yep, we're gonna like give black people civil rights. Like, no, like that was that was a massive struggle that people had to carry out on their own, very similar to the massive struggle that we have to carry out to free people from the insidiousness of fiat money. Yeah. It's interesting that that when <laughs> your case that you make about the wind farm and the energy is exactly <laughs> what I also meant when I said progressives, right? Like that whole energy angle must fascinate you right if if you deem yourself a progressive but i think it's kind of like then then you have to figure out okay where do you get your information from or who do you believe and then they're actually more like the boomers that you just illustrated right yeah this certain institute or someone with a label uh i don't know or somewhere up a hierarchy told told me this is this is bad and uh you know criminals use it and uh, whatever so that is now my uh my point right and that's what i'm going to defend but the real digital native millennials at least i hope there's there's some of them are also progressive and they still think like this but i agree with you you know like the fact that you can find other information than what what you've been taught that's actually a very very powerful thing right because if you have an open mind or if you want to think for yourself right or if you're discovering like what do i actually think of certain things then you know if that door in your mind is just open enough and you find other information you know not from a random uh dude on facebook but you know actually lots of credible people for example on twitter right like that's also i think why <laughs> a lot of these progressives hate twitter um you know, serious people that have serious thoughts that are serious in sharing that, right? And once you're open to receiving that, then you can actually, for some people, you know, for the first time in your life, actually think for yourself. And that's, I think, just the, the first step for a lot of people to actually find other information, consume that information, and then realize, oh, wow, like, what do I actually think about this right what's my opinion or what do i believe and it all like the rest of the journey only starts 
starts there. So I'm I'm personally really fascinated by like the personal journey of a lot of people just to switch your mentality from I know that I don't know everything. And so I need to gather information if I want to, you know, form this opinion and not just follow some random, you know, whatever person that says like this, this is how you should, should think. So I love that about millennials too. So I hope uh, I see in my YouTube stats that I'm actually reaching millennials. So for all, all the people <laughs> listening, you yeah, start thinking for yourself. Uh, I wanted to you, ask you, a question. I, I just want to comment on that. And yeah, that, sorry. Uh, go ahead. Like I, I, yeah. What you pointed out, like, I think it's really important that, like, the, all of this only starts the, when the possibility of what you've been told has been incorrect becomes an opening. And that was one of the things about how COVID and sort of the vaccine and all of that played out that I thought was really powerful and important was that while as destructive as it was, it opened the door for a lot of people to go, whoa, like, my, my government might actually have been lying to me about stuff and that opens them to the possibility of now looking at history and all the different things that have happened there. but i also think that, that that now allows for there to be the space to actually go gather that information and synthesize it mm. on their own you know and it was funny because i actually had an interaction a few months ago that uh frankly was terrifying because like we we had a very similar conversation of like yeah like stuff's real wacky there's like lots of different information out there that's like totally off base and, and like, I sort of thought me and the guy were moving the same direction. He was like, yeah, he's like, it's really important that we like address this like misinformation issue. And he was like, that's why, like, I think it's really great to see that, like, they, they want to get like a misinformation council. And I was like, whoa, I was like, hang on. I was like, you, wow. so like, you think that that's like a good idea that there becomes a government agency that's in charge of telling us what's true and what's not. And he was like, well, yeah, like how else? is it possible for us to be able to tell the difference between what's true and what's false? And like, I literally got on my chair and started yelling. I was like, wow. this is even fucking sick, man. Like, that's what it is, is that I can <laughs> tell you if you hold a lighter under your hand and it feels good, like you can try it out. And if it doesn't fucking feel good, you can stop and go, gee, golly, that was wrong. Like, that's the important thing. We can like take information that's right and wrong and we can compare them with each other and use that to figure out what is right and what is wrong. And at this point he was like, well, but the, there's just too much information out there. We can't do that. And I was like, no, 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 we absolutely can. You don't want to because it's too hard for you, and that's fine, but don't include me in that. And I'm pretty sure at this point I literally just, like, walked away from the conversation. But it's really scary to me because there, <laughs> yeah. there are, I'd say, probably a majority of people that actually have a strong belief that, like, you know, this, like, misinformation council or whatever you want to call them, that, like, these people are, and it's funny because, like, again, this is a place that uh, I sort of I, I have a soft spot in my heart for progressives of that, like, this is part of their own naive worldview of that, like, hey, like people out there are like good and like standing up for their morals and what they mean. It's like, no, bro, like these are nihilistic pieces of shit that got in the position that they're in by not having any ethical basis whatsoever. And this is the same reason why these people can boldface lie to you about shit. Like that there's weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, that to be clear, the United States then went and murdered more than a fucking million Iraqi people under this lie. Like that's, those are like real human beings that died because the American public bought this kind of bullshit lie. And so it's really important to understand like this idea of getting to the truth, like there's a very, very real cost of it and that's one of the reasons again when we talk when i i talk with liberals and they're like oh i love obama he was such a great president across the board i'm like yeah it wasn't it great that he fucking drone bombed more than 2200 innocent brown children wasn't that a fucking great thing that he did and they're like whoa hang on man like you, you look slow down i'm like yeah the that's fact that he started all these unconstitutional serious. fucking oh wars God. asshole like come on think for yourselves guys so sorry, my, my diatribe there, but it, it makes me angry because I think progressives, again, they have yeah. their heart in the right place. They're just not fucking thinking it through. It's like they're looking in the wrong direction, but like now that you're talking, it's I kind of characterize this as, isn't this like a fiat symptom as well? Like a fiat money symptom, right? Because if you're, if you're a fully adopted 
you know, in the fiat money system and you never think about it, like lots of people don't do just like I didn't do before, you know, there's all these um, responsibilities that you gave to other people to decide for you, you know, that eventually influence your life, right? Whether it's the, the worth of the money itself, the taxes, you know, all, all that stuff. And so when you get confronted with something that big, oh, you love Obama, so you love killing children with drones, right? That's just so earth shattering in a sense, you know, that the instant reaction is, no, no, like I have to uh, defer my responsibility, <laughs> uh, which means I'm not going to think about this. So I'm not even going to discuss with you, right? I, f I feel that's like a symptom. It's like a, it's just how people operate and they only take responsibility in like, a, you know, logically in like a family setting or children or whatever, you know, but we are part of this, of this bigger thing, as you said, as you said, that there's real humans dying because you in part also allow it to because you don't think about the brokenness of the fiat money right so it's also like you're complicit in it in a, in a sense but that's very big yeah and i mean like the 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 truth is is that that evokes a sort of uh, existential angst that's so big that most people flee from it most people go whoa whoa fuck no put, put on the netflix yeah we can't think about this and and, and frankly uh, this is actually like one of the largest and the most painful areas of my own life that has actually caused for me to lose many relationships. And like it, it, it sucks in a lot of ways. Um, and with that being said, I also gained many relationships, particularly my ones through Bitcoin with it. But it's very hard because a lot of times you look at it and, you know, you go, well, well what am I supposed to do? How can I address this in any meaningful way? You know, and, uh, it's very difficult. And I think that, again, that's why many of us have came to Bitcoin because like it's not it's not like I put all this together on my own without Bitcoin. I mean, I have to continually return to Bitcoin because of this and with this. And it's really important to understand the way that we can connect all of these things in a greater and more holistic way, because the way that Bitcoin allows for us to lens and view things through this sort of critique of fiat is really important because then that allows for us to address all of the other systemic issues that are going on. And to me, like one of the key ones is food. Like, why is it that our food systems are so dysfunctional? And well, if you look at it, like something like corn syrup, the number one additive in food products today, like that was only invented in 1982. And the reason that it's so successful is because through the fiat monetary system, Corn farmers were able to go to the government and get huge subsidies, massive subsidies that allow for them to grow corn below production costs that's normalized for anybody else. So they can now produce corn at a fraction of the cost that anybody could actually produce it at. And now they can create all this synthetic sludge that they can dump on the market. That now means, well, hey, I can go to the store and I could buy celery and other healthy foods. But those are, you know, going to be five times more expensive than me buying, you know, the corn syrup slop over here that's been price collapsed. And yeah. it's not just here, but it's sort of across the board where we've seen these sort of affects. And it's very important to be able to pinpoint and criticize the methods and ways that fiat has done this to us. And that's only possible once you actually have opened your eyes to seeing how this system controls us. And, and frankly, a very frightening and terrifying way, you know, and it's uh, it's very similar to sort of having the conversations with people about, you know, like Epstein didn't kill himself. And it's like, ha ha ha, we get that. And it's like, well, like, have you dug into like who he is and what he was doing? And they're like, well, yeah, but like that's conspiracy stuff. And it's like it's a conspiracy that the president of the United States at the point in time went to this man's Island where they were clearly raping children on 36 different occasions. Like, it's really important to get what, like, I, again, I get like, this is insanely dark, but we do have to actually consider for a moment that maybe the president of the United States was raping children facilitated by an Israeli Mossad agent. And again, I get, it sounds fucking crazy on its face, but let's actually look at the documentation. And if this is true, we really should consider, are these the people that we want running our government? 
Just a question, you know? Yeah. Do you think that response, I um, I don't know who I listened to. Maybe it was Patrick, Bad David. Like I listened to a podcast where someone said um, that they that they kept their child from using an iPad or watching like YouTube kids stuff um, until his daughter was five or something. And then he said, well, the first time she watched something or she went through YouTube kids or just like, you know, or, or Netflix, just she was watching some cartoon show. And then there were children in that show and one kid um hit another kid and his child was very upset that these two kids were were fighting that was her initial reaction and then a week after or something she was watching something again and there was again some sort of violence or like one one character hitting another character and now she was laughing and so he told this story on this podcast and the other guys were laughing but then he asked like hey do you like the john wick movies and then i thought to myself I think John Wick is pretty cool. Like he shoots all the people, etc. Right? And then he said, "But this is the same thing. It's like the the violence gets. Uh, I don't even know how to what, what word to use, but you know, it it turns into entertainment, and you laugh about it, or you think it's cool. But it's also a way to prep you for like distancing yourself from that real world thing that occurs in lots of places around the world. Right? It's to to create a cognitive dissonance, like this is not real. This is just, you know, this is a movie type thing, you know, and what you just referenced, you know, with the whole Epstein thing or, or any, you know, story that is really dark, people just instantly go to like, oh, this is sounds like a movie plot can't be real. Right. Or I saw this once in a movie or it can't be real stuff like that. It's, it's also your, your condition to, you know, instantly distance yourself from that and to just not ask any other question or maybe even spend an hour researching, you know, um, online. Like I find that so it's fascinating because it also doesn't make sense that for all these types of stories where people say like, you know, you should really look into this or this is not how you, how you thought it was that that's all made up. Like uh, there's just random people sitting somewhere making shit up and then there's like other people that say like oh yeah it makes sense and then they're they're all just making stuff up like that that doesn't make sense to me but it's i i understand it's hard to go down that darker path than you would usually go down perhaps to just find information that yeah, you I mean, think like, for yourself right but this is sort of the the meta thing that happens specifically about uh like, again, it, it's very intimidating and existentially threatening to realize, like, how deeply we're captured and programmed and augmented by this. Uh, and I think one of the biggest ones is, is that, like, part of me being an anarchist is that, like, I am a militant anti-war activist. Uh, and the amount that uh, violence and war and militarism is high, I find absolutely horrifying and ludicrous. I recently, like, I was listening to a podcast where, like, they, you know, it was about this guy, who, like, he's a Navy SEAL and, you know, all this great stuff. And, you know, he, he's, like, venerated for all these reasons. And as I was listening to it, like, I had to turn it off. So I was like, this dude, like, readily and openly admits that, like, he's, he's, he's murdered hundreds of people for the state. And, like, no, it's like, it's like just like a non issue for people. And it just, like, blows my fucking mm. mind that, like, so here's a man who has actually killed other human beings. He like he has taken the lives of other people, and because it was done at the behest of the state, and we were told these were bad guys, that like that just that just that relegates the issue away, and like it's fucking crazy. And again, like in sort of the irony and and the 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 tragic fate that seems to be modernity. That's also why you get all these young men who are like, yeah, I'll go fight the war in Afghanistan or Iraq and I'll be some great hero. And pew, pew, it'll be a lot of fun. And they come back and they're horrifically <laughs> fucked up human beings because they realize the very real moral crime that they engaged in, you know, and, and I feel mm. I feel particularly fortunate because uh, my grandfather, he, he was a fighter pilot in World War II and he, he was on Iwo Jima. Um, and there was an interesting, essentially, their airfields got raided at night by the Japanese, uh, and they had to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And so my grandpa, he, he told me wow. a number of 
stories about how he he had to wait in a ditch for like Japanese men to come find to kill him, and he had to like pop up behind them and stab them to death. Uh, and he was saying like, and you know, after this had happened a number of times, there was a night where the sun was set, and he was just like fucking sobbing in his trench because he realized like he had to do this again. Uh, and he imparted all of this on his deathbed, and he pretty much was like, "Look, like don't." don't ever fucking engage in killing somebody. He was like, you don't understand. He was like, I'm, I'm 60 years past this. Like I have lived my life going to church almost every day after that. And I can't get the fucking blood off my hands. And like, I'm about to go meet wow. my maker. And I know that he is going to forbid me from entering into the kingdom of heaven. because I performed this crime that I didn't understand. And I was just like, you know, I was like a 19 year old kid. I'm like, oh, okay. Like, thanks grandpa. I appreciate it. But that's really stuck with me is because, like, it's really important to understand that, like, as much as we make up these fantasies and these ideas about what violence is and, and the way that it controls our minds and conduct, that, like, these are real things that happen to people that, like, we have to take responsibility for. And uh, it's really sad yeah. and scary, in my opinion, how much a lot of people don't think or consider about, you know, and again, this relates back to the Obama stuff with like, this is why I'm an anti-war activist is that like, even if your great liberal president says that we're, you know, destroying the evil terrorists across the board, like, is that actually true? And it turns out when you look at the statistics, it's not. It actually turns out that 95% of the time we're killing innocent people. And like, that requires a very special thought process to really step back and do an analysis of to realize that like we kill innocent people based on lies that we're told by our politicians. And is that something that we want to participate in? For me, absolutely not. And I know I can't vote my way out of it, but I can take my economic power and put it into a form of money that they cannot control and that they cannot use in order to make that form of war. So to me, that was one of the leading things for me and why I have my involvement with Bitcoin is that I want an independent money system that can't be used in order to finance infinite wars. So you wrote about this uh, before. How how can Bitcoin then contribute to a return to more truth and accountability instead of, you know, not having values use or just being nihilistic? Like how most of the world is now like what how well, does it help I mean, to get there i think i think the most powerful one is this word accountability in a dualistic sense one is the the very real mathematical accounting that goes into the financing of war if you look at currently how the department of defense the pentagon and other agencies are financed it's not just through tax revenue it's through literally the fictionalizing up of new money that then gets issued to these people that can then go spend on Infinity War. And furthermore, through something like Bitcoin, there is a very real accountability on a personal sense to say, I hold this money, I can keep this money, and I can utilize it to make sure that if governments were ever to actually like use Bitcoin as their actual unit of accounting, they can't just fictionalize it up anymore. That we can actually return to a world where the power of the purse has meaningful accountability towards the people and the financing that it does. And like, this is another very long historical arc that if anybody has curiosity about it, I would very much encourage you to look into. But the only way that World War I, World War II, and all of the successive wars were even a possibility was fundamentally done through the creation of fiat money. It could not be done on a gold standard. Like these wars were too large, they were too robust, and they were too inclusive to be able to sustain the amount of economic uh, parasitism that was involved with, like, it, it couldn't happen on a gold standard. And so if we can get ourselves to return to a world where we have the power of the purse directly at the fingertips of the people everywhere, this can actually stop global war in a way that we haven't seen in centuries. Yeah, I love that it's basically forced... The transparency forces you to play along, right? Like the, the transparency of the system of Bitcoin forces you to be ethical and just, basically, right? Because the 
the foundational layer of Bitcoin it just represents a truth. And if we commit to that truth and everything done upon that layer has to commit to that, right? Like you cannot scam your way out of it in a sense, like you cannot escape the um, responsibility that is, that is connected with using that system. Yeah. And, and making this connection between ourselves and our economic power, I think is very important because, uh, again, this is one of the things that fascinates me about the contemporary world is that like money unequivocally, like is the most important thing going on in all of our lives, not by virtue of it being, you know, the highest principle or whatever, but like our actual everyday day to day live things and interactions that we have with people like money is what governs it. And yet so few people actually even understand what that is in any meaningful way. And so once you can really start asking what is money, how is value created, how is money supposed to function, that you can start to uncover these layers and start to really question it in a deeper and more meaningful way. And to me, the most important part of these ethical questions is really asking, well, who should control the money? How should it be created? Is like, is it fair or appropriate for money to get unilaterally created by the government and then distributed to, to other people? You know, I'm like, I, I find it absolutely horrifying to think of the hundreds of billions of dollars that have specifically been funneled to the Ukrainian war from the American government. And look, like, whatever your opinion about that war is, the question is, is, is should American money be unilaterally distributed by politicians or should there be some form of larger democratic accountability in order to ensure that? And I think most people would agree with the latter of those two because like it, it's just what makes sense and is yeah. logical. And again, this is the stuff that returns me to progressives of, of I want to go look like if you actually believe in democracy or republicanism in any meaningful way, why the fuck? Are there all of these different agencies and apparatuses that get to unilaterally use our money without us having any say whatsoever in how that gets used? You know, and a lot of times I find that people don't yeah. necessarily want to think that much deeper. And I think that's the biggest thing is, is that I would encourage millennials that like I get a lot of these things are pretty big and uh, overwhelming. But it's really important that you actually take the time and energy to understand it, because if you don't, the people that do understand it are going to use your lack of understanding to control you in a way that you can't escape from. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's clearly happening, of course, right? Like you, you there, there's so many of these videos on Twitter or Instagram where, you know, you see these people sitting in their car saying like, oh, I have a hundred thousand dollar something, something education, you know, and, uh, I'm not even working in that profession because it pays like shit and now I have three jobs and I'm rolling sushi. But I really have no clue actually as to why why that is, you know. And I find that so fascinating that I hope that just for lots of people that that should be like the wake up call, right? Like you Well, I'm like you are I, literally I would also being encourage, stolen like, from but be yeah. like be fucking angry. Like the, like you did the, you mm. did what you were told. You like went to school, you got good grades. You like listened to your school counselor exactly, and principal yeah. who were like, yeah, like go to school, take out those massive fucking loans to like get your education in, in contemporary dance theory. Like, like that's a great idea. Like they fucking scammed you. And now you have to work at Starbucks 40 hours a week, barely scraping by because they encourage you to take out massive unsecured loans to get a degree that they told you was going to be a worthwhile thing. And the truth is, is that was to lock you into this life that scammed you. And you should be fucking outraged about it in the same way that you should be outraged about the fact that these baby boomers got to go in and buy up all the fucking property in the 1970s before the money got absolutely fucked. And now they jack the prices through the roof and they turn to you and go, yeah, you should pay $3,000 for your rent for your one bedroom apartment when you barely even make that. Like this was a system that was explicitly designed to take advantage of you. And you should be very, very angry about that. And I want to encourage you that the one thing that you can use as a tool to fight back is Bitcoin. 
including like and like I specifically say this to millennials that are like at the end of the rope that have a shitload of debt that are barely scraping by that don't see an exit and look like some people would definitely disagree with me on this, but I'd say take as much unsecured debt as you can buy as much Bitcoin as you can with it and fucking default on that. These pieces of shit allowed for the banks in 2008 to default on more money than has ever been defaulted on in the history of the world. And guess what? They got bailed the fuck out. Meanwhile, you're just trying to feed yourself and they don't, they, they want to say that you have an obligation to pay back this debt to the largest financial institutes in the world. Get fucked. Buy as much Bitcoin as you can default on that debt and move to a country that doesn't fucking hate you and want to take advantage of you. You know, and again, I get all of this is very extreme, but I want to be clear, like this is also your life and there isn't going to be an exit. Inflation isn't going down. Rents aren't going to decrease. This is going to be a long and difficult road. And if you stop, if you allow for yourself the permission to stop playing by their rules for a little bit and to protect and defend yourself first, then to meet the honor of your debt obligations to them. I do think your life will improve. I'm not saying that there isn't risk and I'm not saying that there isn't difficulty in it. But what's really important is once you have Bitcoin off an exchange that you hold in your own personal private wallet that you control the keys to, they can't steal that from you. And if you're already impoverished and don't have anything, that's going to be much more meaningful for you than any other amount of money. And I'll also tell you what, $20,000 is going to get you a hell of a lot farther in a place like Thailand or Bali, which are great places to be, than it is going to get you in a place like New York or San Francisco. So I only throw that out there because I think it's really important to understand that there is a way for you to actually walk away from this and have some money, but it does require some real sacrifice. And I think it's really important that people at least consider that as being a real option. Hmm. I agree on the like extreme part. Like I, I agree with you, but I also understand this is a this would be a big thing for people to do, right? But I think it starts with realizing that the system that you're in is like a construct made by people no better than you, no smarter than you, no more special than you or whatever. But you are the subject. You are the subject of this system. You are not an actor in this system, although you maybe sometimes feel like an actor, right? When you do your uh, education and you get the loan or you, you know, whatever, like, like the, the classic path, right? But I think what you just mentioned as the application, like if once you understand that you are a subject in the system and the system is a construct and there's actually another system that has been constructed, then you can just move. You can just move. You know, you don't have to wait. I, I asked Jeff Booth, like, uh, some thought about the future of Bitcoin. And then he said, like, it's now. You can move now. You know, and I hear that in what you said. Like, you can abuse, in a sense, the system that wants to abuse you. And then you just leave. Like, it, it's actually... The action is fairly simple once you understand and integrate and accept that you are the subject of a system and that you can become the actor in another system that would actually works for you, right? Because that, that other system, Bitcoin, is a mutually beneficial system where everyone who contrib contributes in that system also reaps benefits from that system, right? It's not this, the zero-sum fiat game. And yeah, those yeah, are just and, my and, thoughts. And, like, I, think, I think it's really nice what you said. Like it's, it's, a, it's scary, but you can do it. <laughs> you know, like it's totally doable. Well, like, and this is... This is what I really want to encourage for a particular class of people that I like. I was there too at one point in time. And it's really important to understand that, like, when I got involved with Bitcoin and went all in, like, this wasn't like a, like, this is a brilliant investment and I'm going to make a bunch of money. No, like, this was an act of true desperation where I was like, I'm living at my parents' house. I have no money. I have a bunch of student debt. I am broke as hell. I hate my life. I don't want to go to my job that I have to go to on Monday. I'm horrifically depressed and I want to kill myself. 
And at this point, a little voice popped up in my head and was like, well, why don't you just, just, just buy all the Bitcoin you can? And I was like, what? I was like, that sounds fucking crazy. That sounds like the dumbest fucking thing I could ever do. And I was like, yeah, then don't you, you have the real reason to kill yourself then, huh? If you buy all the magic money and it goes to zero, you really have the reason to kill yourself. And I was like, yeah, oh, that's a good point, voice. And I was like, but if it works out, you have to help perform the Bitcoin mission. And I was like, all right, all right, this is like a fair deal. I made the deal and it turned out that like, this actually worked out really well for me, you know, and granted, like I got in early, I got in a lot earlier than other people, but I really want to bring back the point of that. This isn't like other unsecured money obligations. This isn't like a car that can get repossessed. This isn't like a house you can get kicked out of. If you get a tranche of Bitcoin and this, and, and like the other one I really want to emphasize is that like, you defaulting on your debt isn't like some ethical or moral crime. And to be very clear, like, this is what banks do every 20 years. And then the government comes and goes, well, we'll just collectivize and steal a bunch of money from the people and give it to you rich CEOs and, and other banking people. Like, that happens repeatedly, constantly. Mm -hmm. And so, like, it's very important to understand, like, this isn't a system that is ethical or thoughtful or kind to you, and you don't have an obligation to it. So if you are in a position of very real desperation of not understanding how you will escape, this is, like, this is an escape, escape hatch. And I get it's scary, but you can actually renege on this debt, go to somewhere for a while, live out a life for yourself. And the other one that's true is that, like, it turns out, that when you default on all this debt and refuse to pay it, and these guys have no way to get it back from you, that actually gets you a place at, at the negotiation table where you can actually sit down with these debt collectors and go, tell you what, I'll give you 10 cents on the dollar. And they go, fuck you. You go, no, 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 fuck you. Now I'm not going to give you anything. And they go, whoa, whoa, whoa how, about, how about 15 cents on the dollar? And now you can go, all right, mm. now we can have a conversation. But like, again, the current design of the fiat system is to exploit you and make sure that you are powerless. Bitcoin is the opposite. It is a system that wants to empower you. And again, like as Bram and I were talking about before, in the conversations with each other and understanding what we're building, like that's why I'm here. And that's why I participate in Bitcoin is because I want you to be empowered and I want you to participate in our system because it is mutually beneficial to each other. The more people that get into Bitcoin and are involved with it, the more it benefits me, but the more it benefits you as well. And I want you to know I love you and care about you enough that I think you should have a money that I can't steal from. You. I think you should have a money that I can't use to exploit you. Dude, I say this all the time. <laughs> Also to my friends, like, please buy Bitcoin because I love you. You know, I really feel that it's an altruistic thing to help to educate people on Bitcoin. But the initial reaction you get is like, yeah, of course, because you got in earlier and you want to get rich. <laughs> it's like, okay, you'll get there. You'll get there, you know, that you understand that that's not the point. But it's fascinating to, for me to actually realize like, Six years ago, I would have never thought that I would say this, you know, so it does take time for, I almost want to say like your personality to adapt to that new belief that, or well, belief that you created based on the rational thing that you saw or discovered, right? And that now that we're talking about it, this is not, this is not you know, the Ponzi way of talking about it, like uh, Jamie Dimon would probably say, but it's the altruistic thing, like, please do it. Help yourself. Think for yourself. Just do it. And well, and the, the, this belief if though, not, is then, about yeah, you, yeah. This belief is about the recovery from nihilism, and that most people live in the nihilism, and that's sort of the irony yes. of why people respond yes. to you in the first place in that way. Of that, like, well, like it has to be a Ponzi scheme. It can't be anything else because we live in a nihilistic world where we all have to take advantage of each other, and there's no other possibility. And it turns out that actually the belief in the truth. And that the truth is actually a thing of meaning in this world that has a radical understanding that we can come to logically with each other. And that's why Bitcoin is so important is I'm not yes. saying just trust me on this. In fact, I'm saying the opposite. 
I'm saying you should go verify what I'm saying. You should go engage in the proof of work to understand for yourself why Bitcoin has a fixed supply, what that fixed supply means against a fiat money system that has infinite numbers, how and why, if you actually hold your own private keys, why I can't just randomly guess those 12 words and why the math behind it actually is dignified in such a way that you can know you can actually know by doing the math yourself that i can't randomly guess those 12 words nor can any other power in yeah you don't have to believe us as compared to every other thing in the world you can actually check if it's true and that's that that is the entire point that that's maybe that's just the core of bitcoin in a sense Right, like you can see that what you see, uh, well, you can investigate that what you see is actually true. Well, try to do that with any other thing, probably. Yeah, fascinating. Well, and, and this no, is also this, that, this is that, a really that, good point. I, yeah, this is also the affect that starts to transform people in a much more holistic way beyond Bitcoin. Is that for me, and this is what I've seen, is this radical encounter with the truth. It fundamentally rescues us Mm. from a nihilistic worldview where we actually understand, oh, like the truth actually is a radical thing that we can use to transform the world. And when I take that same form of thought and I go, well, is all this stuff that I've been told about food and that fats are bad? Is that actually true? Holy shit. It's not. It is all this, you know, and like whatever it comes to, it's really important because you start to transform how you think where you start to lead, oh, maybe I shouldn't actually trust people that tell me to trust them. And in fact, maybe that's actually a signal that I shouldn't trust them and that I should take the extra time and energy to go check what they're telling me is true. And and frankly, like this is another place that you start to run up against that place where stuff can get dark enough that you can become intimidated. You know, and, and for me, like this is where some of my philosophical work comes into is that like, look like the, And it's hard for people to understand this, like, what makes this system evil isn't that there's like a bunch of maniacal people out there being like, muhaha, we get to take advantage of of poor, stupid people by doing this. No, actually, it's quite the opposite. It's actually people who they've never even thought about if this thing is evil. And this is what Hannah Arendt's whole point was with Eichmann in Jerusalem was that Eichmann, the guy who was in charge of shipping all of the Jews off to the camps to be killed in the Holocaust, when he was approached with this question, he couldn't even wrap his head around it. He always maintained through the whole thing that Mm. he was a good, upstanding citizen that was obeying the law and that he had to obey his superiors if they were going to be able to live in a good and functional society. And our dance criticism was she was like, look at this fucking pea brain moron. We're approaching him with a very real ethical question about his involvement in killing millions of people, and he can't even fucking self-reflect on it. Like, that's how far removed he is. And so it's not that he's some maniacal, evil asshole. It's that he's not even capable of thinking that what he's involved with is evil. And that's why there are so many yeah. people out there who are involved in banking, financing, and everything across the board. When you approach them with these issues, they can't think about it. They just reject it and go, whoa, 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 you're getting too meta on me, man. Like, I look like I'm just a, a poor little club soldier, and I just do what I'm told. And so if they say I have to go to Iran or I have to go to Yemen or wherever I go, that's just what I do. You know, like, I, it's not for me to think about whether or not this is right or wrong. And that's the exact thing that I'm insisting upon is that we are actual ethical agents in this world. And we do have the power and capacity to self-reflect for ourselves and ask, is this form of money that we currently use called fiat, is it fair and equitable to the people of the world and utilized for good purposes or is it something else? And if it's something else, then we have to take the very real responsibility for ourselves to say, perhaps it is time for something new to transform and change our world. And it happens to be that Bitcoin is that very thing that we can do that with. Do you see Bitcoin? Could, would you define Bitcoin as a tool to enlightenment? Um, enlightenment such a big word. Uh, 
I don't think I would use enlightenment. What I would say is Bitcoin. I also a wanted tool. to hear your definition. <laughs> I, is Bitcoin a tool to open people to the radical possibilities that they don't believe are possible today? Absolutely. Is Bitcoin the most powerful tool that we have today to rescue ourselves from the endemic nihilism that has consumed everything? Absolutely. And is Bitcoin a way? that together we can utilize to transform the fundamental nature of reality as we understand it? Yeah, I think so. Uh, and I understand that like, and again, like what we were talking about before the recording that like, when I get together with other Bitcoiners and we kind of start ping ponging back and forth and reflecting on this, like, and this is what some of my work philosophically deals with is that like, I do actually think that this is unequivocally the largest and the most important development in all of human history and the reason why i say and like even more than the printing press and other things is because of how radical this technology is and the fact that this is the only thing that can allow for us to utilize the internet in an economic form where there is no single entity that controls it and to me like that is the only thing that can allow for us to transition from a state-based panoptic surveillance society into an open, free, global society. And, and frankly, I don't think there's an in-between. We either get uh, totalitarian state surveillance where all things are monitored by everybody at all points in time for the approval or disapproval of governments, or we get radical, free, entrepreneurial world where Bitcoin becomes the core money that all people use and states have to submit themselves to what it means that their people now have a free and independent money. I don't think there's an in-between. I agree. And so you, you've you also written a lot about, or you often touch on like theological aspects. How how do you see Bitcoin in relation to, to those? Uh, as I've said, you know, earlier in this conversation, like I, I believe it is actually a deeply rescuing thing from nihilism. And I think when you have this radical encounter with the truth, like to me, like if you call it the truth or God or whatever, like to me, what that truth represents is this higher form of power. That there is actually reason and goodness in the world and that there is an actual mm. very real possibility that we can change all of this fucked up nonsense that we've inherited from our, our fathers and grandfathers. And it turns out that by the virtue of our ancestors and the deep philosophical thinking that they told us to align yourself with truth, there becomes this new, deep, personalized empowerment that I think is very deep and meaningful that I, I feel is spiritual. And for me, it helped put myself on a path of realizing that my involvement with Bitcoin isn't about number go up. And frankly, like I kind of find number go up a bit comical in light of this other thing. To me, what it's really about is participating in the creation of a new global fair economic system where we can actually truly align ourselves with the principles and the accountability that we want and what it means to be responsible and to care for ourselves as beings who, who will pass this world on to the next generation. And to me, it's very important to understand that Bitcoin honors and venerates the future generations insofar that it says, no, we, we are not going to be able to unilaterally create money and steal from the future in order to be able to finance things of today. And I think that that's a very, very important thought and mode that we must connect with in order to actually really change things in a meaningful way. Yeah. And so... I think I think I know what you will say, but if I would ask you why do all roads lead to Bitcoin, what what is the answer there? Well, I think when you kind of look at the you know global economic system and how the internet has had a radical transforming effect over the last thirty years, Bitcoin's the only fair and equal form of money that works everywhere for all people irregardless of government or citizen status or any other sort of identifying form. And so I think once you actually go through the logical permutations of trying to understand 
what is the most ideal form of money that people could be using in a globalized digital society as our own, Bitcoin's the only answer. You know, and if you want to go through your shitcoin arc as well, like you'll have to look at why is anonymity so important and powerful here. And it turns out that like, if one is not anonymous, that creates a very real physical body that can be destroyed by governments that will be threatened by a free and independent money system. Because frankly, it is an actual existential threat to the existence of all states everywhere today, because there is not a single state in existence today that isn't radically dependent on fiat money and how it functions and is issued. Yeah, I once I once talked to a guy who said, like, I don't know if Bitcoin can um, really uh, replace fiat money. I, I think it can, but that's what he said. But he said, if it lives alongside, if this new system is established alongside, you know, the old system, then inevitably that old system will get like checked more right it's kind of like uh um the new system of bitcoin would force the old system to behave better or else you know everyone will actually move right so i found that an interesting thought like it would be great if we would really have like a bitcoin standard i i believe in that but i think we will also get somewhere already if it's like a parallel um if it's like a parallel thing especially yeah, I, do, if, I do think it'll it ultimately so obvious, be you know, yeah advantageous insofar to that uh you know that that system countered against bitcoin will force it to behave better in addition to like look like if states really want to like get their shit together and behave in a meaningful and thoughtful way these two systems paired together will actually probably work out pretty well together so um hmm. yeah i i feel pretty great about where we're going and actually i gotta start wrapping up just because uh i gotta go catch a flight to go halfway around the world so <laughs> awesome let's do that two two short questions to end if there's a Good. short answer i hope to this one how do i know if i'm an anarchist i think Probably the best one is, is that you believe in the agency of individuals to make decisions for themselves that are going to be the best for themselves and for their community, that you really think that people can utilize their own agency and thought and morals to make decisions for themselves and that they don't need to relegate those decisions to an authority outside and beyond their own control. Love that. Feels like I'm an anarchist then. <laughs> okay. Last question. I ask everyone the same question. What's a core belief you will never let go? That truth is something of meaning in this world. And that trying to understand it and get closer to it will always be something positive that will give in a way that is sort of an infinite vehicle. That, there, that the truth doesn't need anyone to stand up for itself. It can stand on its own. And that in and of itself makes it the most important thing that we can encounter. Love that, man. That's a, that's a great ending to this conversation, man. Uh, thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate your time. And uh, Absolutely. yeah, hope to do this again uh, somewhere in the future. Fun, fun to jam, man. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. I greatly appreciate your time. And uh, yeah, I hope some millennials uh, get, get some good, good content from that. Cheers, man. Thanks. Be well. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke, that's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.